Hello and welcome to the Southbound Sports Show. I'm your host, Richie Leahy, here with my co-host, Matty B. And uh, I just saw the news that, um, as a recap from the other week, we talked about Mike Tyson. He's not going to be charged for that plane incident to kick off the show. Well, so, he, he shouldn't have. I know. They were making it seem like the other guy dropped the charges. But still, you're still going to have to go to court and like plead your case on why. Like, what did you do to Mike Tyson? Because if people were saying, well, Mike Tyson assaulted that dude. But if the dude actually threw something at him or hit him with stuff, because the video was definitely cut. I mean, the court's going to want to see the full video. So I bet the other guy doesn't want to see that getting out. Because there were rumors that the guy threw something at Tyson first. He turned around and punched him in the head a couple of times. Like, it wasn't very long, the video of him fighting him. So uh, I'm glad that that got dropped. Uh, but I, I still see people arguing on the other side of it. It's like, why do you want to see Mike Tyson go to court? Like, why do you want to see that? <laughs> like, the guy in the other place definitely instigated it. And if he threw something at him, I mean, we'll never know the way his buddy cut the video. So the, um, that's our kickoff to the show. The other big news coming out of the NFL, my man Tom Brady makes plans to join the booth at Fox, making him... The highest paid broadcaster, I believe, right? Or Yeah, broadcaster yes. ahead of Jim Rome, which I'm surprised Jim Rome um, is that high, considering doesn't he only do his radio show still? I'll be honest. I didn't even know that he was doing anything. So to see he was, he was pulling the kind of money that he is, kudos to his agent. Yeah, I think he does most of their, like, CBS Sports Radio. I think that's where he's with, according to this. So that's the big one. The other big one from them is Tony Romo, that everyone knew had a major deal. Um, but Tom Brady, the way his deal structured, it almost looked to me like a Manning Brothers deal, right? Where he's kind of just giving insight. And I'm surprised to see Peyton Manning not on that list. Maybe his aren't really disclosed or whatever. Because with Tom Brady, it made it seem like he could just work whenever he wanted to. <laughs> and that's kind of how Peyton Manning works, right? He does like his Manning cast, which they broadcast simultaneously, but he's not really like producing that much other content. It's more like little shows with him and they do like the quarterback thing. So I wonder if we're going to get a lot of those or if he's actually just going to be in the booth, which would be kind of cool. Um, but we have to wait and see what happens. I wonder like if the rumors of him potentially joining the Dolphins in the front office and he's working in the booth, like, wouldn't that be kind of a conflict of interest? Yeah. I don't know. So, like, that's the one thing where everyone's like, well, these rumors are true. It's like, okay, well, what's the difference? Like, if they wanted to hire him as a front office guy, they can still do that. Even with the allegations. Like, Tom Brady's not involved in any of the allegations, right? So, like, all they're saying is, like, he, he can't work for the team. Like, I guarantee any team would want him to be a, associated with them. So if he wanted a, a job in the front office as like an owner slash exec, why not? Plus, uh, I mean, I guess I never really thought about it. Are there other owners that are on like TV? Um, I don't know. Because it's not like he would be the main owner anyway. Because there are some guys like, doesn't A-Rod own a bunch of stuff? I thought I saw that he was owning some part of like sports teams or whatever. Uh, but maybe I'm wrong. So... That's the big news. What do you think on it? Would you watch Tom Brady give, uh, like, commenting on stuff? I mean, depending on what game he was calling, it would probably end up will, because I'm sure they're not going to put him on for some random podunk game. Like, I'm sure they're going to put him on for the, the main broadcast. So, yeah, I probably it will, just because of default. default. I'm not going to be like, oh, I really just want to hear what, what what's Tom think of this. Yeah, you're, he's like a best friend of yours. That's what he'll turn into. You watch so much football that you'll be with Tom all the time, and, and then you'll be the one talking about him instead of me. Because <laughs> I always have to sound off, so I won't even know. You'll be like, did you hear what our friend Tom said? I'll be like, no, I did it. Like, <laughs> well, I, I do think it'll be curious. I'm curious to see how that will play out, because when you look at how 
Tony Romo when he first got into broadcasting. He was still like so familiar with the calls that like as he was hearing stuff happen, I was like, oh, this is what's happening right now. And, like just just straight up calling, like what was going to like anticipating what was going to happen. And he's still doing that, which shows you that they really don't change anything because it's been how many years? Yeah. So, I mean, Tom could probably do that. I just have a feeling he's going to just kind of be there, you know? Because, like, when Manning does his, I still get people sending me, like, stuff like, hey, did you hear what Manning said? It's like, no. Like, he's not even on the main (laughs) broadcast. So it would take effort for me to turn on the Manning cast. And I'm not going to do that. So let's see uh, what Tom actually does. But I think it's a good contingency plan. It had to have been in the works before. So, like, like I said, the timing just seems kind of weird going back to the other rumors of him being, like, the owner. He would have been announced as a Fox guy, and then he gets brought on as the owner of the Dolphins. And then he comes out of retirement anyway. Like, he had this deal lined up. And I guess they they probably not, aren't going to argue with him. Like, if he wants to play another year, they'll just push it back. Like, I think Fox has the money that they're ready to go. And so, since we're on the topic, I haven't heard anything else about the Big Ten Network and, like, the Fox deal or whatever. So that'll be something, too, where if they're going to really keep investing in football, because, I mean, like, you buy the Big Ten for football. You buy Tom Brady for football. Like, there are other guys, legends from other sports that have kind of retired lately that you don't see them, like, Fox just paying them obscene amount of the monies without them even being on TV at one time to know how they're going to handle it, right? So we'll Whoa. see if this is a trend because, like, I could see ESPN or someone like doing this with LeBron right after, right? Yeah. He'd, he'd be probably the only guy of that stature that could command like that much money, I would think. Right I don't after even retirement, know, but I don't even know that he would be one that would want want to step into that. Type you think of, he'll do like Looney Tunes still? He might do Looney Tunes. He might, might do Space Jam. Just I think I think people might much, not even know what Looney Tunes are. <laughs> I, it, well, he might just. I think he he'll probably end up just following where his son's playing and just kind of just being like what what some of these NBA dads are doing, where they're just they're just a fan for their kid. And I think that that's fine. Like, I don't I don't know that LeBron has to go to the booth because of how much controversy comes up with him that it, I, I think it'll just be one more distraction unless they really are like pushing for negative or they have the ratings issues then potentially like he would be one that would immediately gain all kinds of additional stuff and we're gonna i didn't even bring in tv numbers so we'll uh we'll be talking about some playoff stuff later in the show um but i think the nba the way the playoffs are going this year it's a lot more balanced Compared to like what has been happening, but not so much. Um, exactly, yeah. You could still get the top teams all advancing. We don't know. The series are close right now, but we'll be getting into that. Um, let's see what else. My other thing that I wanted to bring up, and I, I'll just mention it as a topic because it might be the name of the show next week. But like all these reports are coming out. I'm trying to see, like, hey, is there any big news to talk about on the show? And every report is just like about how some rookie is starting to work with the team, and they're doing great, Matt. You never hear about, like, hey, so-and-so rookie signed, and he's struggling, right? Like, hey, workout started, he's definitely overweight. Like, that, <laughs> that only happens to, like, veterans. Definitely a bust. <laughs> <laughs> like, all right, yeah. I mean, he's already a bust. He's running the wrong way on the field, doesn't know what he's doing. But it's like, all right, awesome, guys. Um, we know that people get hyped up. Every year, I'm already seeing it like fantasy type stuff because I'm looking through the stats and seeing like, hey, any of these guys look like they might contribute. I would feel more along the lines of like running backs uh, like Najee Harris last year or like wide receivers who's going to come in. Um, I saw Chris Olave is already getting mentioned as like a rookie of the year candidate. He wasn't even the top wide receiver taken. They're like trying to say that, oh, the Saints, you know, their offense is just going to be perfect. It's like, Sean Payne's not there. Like, Jameis Winston, they were ready to get rid of him. And so, like, um, what's going to happen to that offense? Uh, Maybe he'll be putting up great numbers. But, like, is Michael Thomas coming back? Like, what's going to happen? 
Like, I want to know what their offense looks like before you start throwing out these assumptions. So we'll be keeping an eye on that. I didn't get any other intel um, for this week to talk about. but There was one other NFL bit. The, the Giants were trying to move their cornerback, Bradbury, and they finally released him after nobody wanted to trade for him. So that could be someone that, depending on how much available cap space the Steelers have, could potentially be a move that now you, you pick up what could be a starting wide or starting cornerback for, for the next couple of years. When they're looking at those last couple pieces to really put the team back together. Well, they're going to need someone like that because I've been talking about it for a few years. Joe Hayden's still taking so much of the cap hit. I mean, up, up until Ben, he was like one of the top guys after him. I'm trying to see. I'll, I'll do a quick look here uh, to see if there's been like, an update on that. I'd be crazy if he was one of the top ones um, still, but I know it's probably TJ Watt and then going down. Is he still in that situation? And there was some speculation that the Tyron Matthew, the honey badger was, was linked to Pittsburgh, but he ended up signing a deal with, with the saints. So that, that, that was a move that made sense since he's, he went to LSU and kind of almost like a return home type deal. So is Joe Hayden not even signed? He's not signed as of now. Yeah, that's what I was looking to see if they would have that cap it. Um, I thought they signed him. Now it's looking like, who knows, they probably won't. So I wonder if they will go in another direction there. Uh, just based on the cap that's here, I think they're still under a good bit. And that's what the projected. So they would have twelve million for this year. I want to say what was Hayden making? Like I don't even think they could fit him in, right? Because the other guy that I've been keeping an eye on is Cole Beasley, and you have the same issue where you get the veteran salary of like Joe Hayden was making like seventeen million or whatever. So the Steelers are going to try to like if they try to bring him back. Um, he's been posting pictures of his abs, Matt, so you know that he's in great shape. He's like, not just eating at, <laughs> eating at the burger shop. It would be funny if he just posted like a ridiculously Photoshop photo that it wasn't even <laughs> clearly him. Um, but Beasley's the other one where I thought, I mean, his production is high enough that who knows? I guess someone's going to have to take a, a, a chance on him, I would think. But you got to wait and see what other deals have to get done. Did the Steelers end up signing all their guys? Um, let's see. I think so, right? So we'll see what happens. Um, that's going to be one we'll be keeping an eye on uh, because that was the last piece I thought Hayden was going to be the guy to sign. Um, but I guess not. I guess they're moving away from him. I need to get back into the mindset of football. I've been watching too much hockey, dude. <laughs> Um, anything else you have for the NFL? No. All right. Uh, the next big thing that I wanted to talk about, the NCAA put out their uh, rules on the NIL, which I think are in line with, with exactly what I've been telling people. Um, and you know that athletes, they were already getting a stipend. People seem to overlook that. Um, I was talking to someone. They were saying that like at the D1 level, like I think when I played, like you got a couple hundred bucks. They were getting like a thousand bucks a month as a stipend, Matt, which makes that Shea Beers and Napier thing even more outrageous. Unless UConn just wasn't paying that, because I thought that it was kind of like required per travel schedule or whatever. So like, if you get a thousand bucks a month, and you can't afford food. What are you spending it on? Right. I guess because that's like even if you split it per week, that's like two hundred something dollars a week. Um, you could be dining out at like the uh, Popeyes or Bojangles, dude, every day. <laughs> Just go to the Golden Corral every day. I don't know why I can't can't <laughs> keep my figure. Hey, what was that beaver thing I ate? <laughs> get, <laughs> get the PED guys after you. Uh, but they're so the NCA they don't really have any enforcement going, but the ruling is going to be pretty big because uh, I've had people tell me that I'm wrong on the show because I've been saying about how. Uh, they're going to be working out local deals with like car dealerships or whatever. And now it makes it even more clear that that's exactly what's going to happen. 
So the NCAA said that a booster can't restrict the deal like the car dealership did with Quinn Ewers at Ohio State where whenever he left to go to Texas, that deal was void. And you remember like they did that video of him turning his keys back in. So those deals going forward are outlawed. I don't think they're going to go back and like penalize Ohio State or whatever because they like didn't really have the rules in place. But if a guy signs an NIL deal for four years as a college quarterback, that business now is on the hook for just that guy. So I think you're going to see things tighten up a bit where the Miami route, where they're just paying every hurricane a flat fee, is going to be the direction that most teams move into. Because that way, if a guy leaves, it doesn't matter. My NIL deal was only for Hurricanes players, you know? And so I think (laughs) that that's the way, unless they clarify this and have a different statement. But the way they're making it seem is that you can sign a deal with, with the school through like the NIL and get that done, which is like I've been saying. That's where you get the local like car dealership saying like, hey, we're going to pay this much for a, a football thing or whatever. And they don't even have to like really do the commercial. I mean, the commercial could just be posted on Instagram. No one's going to care. Uh, the money's going to keep flowing in. And then you're potentially basically just helping bankroll your team. The only thing that's going to happen is like you're not going to see any more of these like crazy, like Dick Saban was like, hey, our guy's getting a $1 million to be the quarterback. Uh, I think you're going to see teams like kind of lay off that because with how many quarterbacks transfer out of different schools and stuff, are they going to really be tied to like Alabama or Oklahoma or like say Joe Burrow, he gets his deal. He was at Ohio State, never really played there. He goes to LSU, uh, maybe more offers come his way. I think you've seen that with the guy from Miami, um, the basketball player. Did you see that um, thing that he gave the statement? He said that like the new transfer that they were giving had a deal coming in that was worth more than what he was getting paid. So he was ready to transfer to a different school to see if he could find more money. And I'm like, dude, what are you talking about? So <laughs> um, I think that's where you're going to kind of see that kind of stuff get cut off. Maybe the transfer portal slows down a bit. Because you're not going to be able to like tamper and say, yo, if you transfer here, we'll give you $5 million. I think you're going to see teams kind of put that package together with the coach where he's like, hey, all of our guys are getting this much as a base NIL. You come here and get production. You can sign on with like whatever company is bigger. And I wonder if that's that's pretty much going to help. And I had a theory on this earlier where school location, if you remember... The big state schools like Penn State that's in the middle of nowhere, it's going to be harder for them to pick up deals like this that are just consistent on the team, right? Because you don't advertise that much compared to like the city, like I drive around Raleigh and I see NC State stuff literally everywhere. They're like tied to the city. So I think like businesses right downtown, they're going to be more inclined to just say, hey, you know what? We're already doing like NC State stuff. Why don't we just throw some money in here? And then get some athletes to come down and be on our posters instead of just like the the Wolfpack stuff, you know, or like the Hurricane. So teams that are in like a bigger city like Pittsburgh, I want to kind of see how that helps them compared to a team like Penn State. I think those are the best direct competition where you have Penn State literally in the middle of nowhere. Like what businesses businesses are getting their athletes to come down? Altoona, State College, like the, they don't, they're not as big as Pittsburgh or like even any of the areas around them. So is that going to play a factor going forward or not? What do you think? I, th- I think it could play a factor. I mean, the I, I like that they're, they're trying to put those restrictions in place to, to, to say which, like, which players you're able to, to make that contact with so that they're starting to put more parameters around the contact the contact of players so that it prevents the teams that you know from the Alabamas of just seeing whoever they want to take and then they can say hey we have a spot and you're going to play right now and immediately just cherry picking whoever they want and almost creating that that soccer style pod system without without necessarily having the actual pods because you would just have these teams that can break the bank and just spend whatever they want on 
whatever players, and then everyone else is just left to pick up the pieces. Plus, I wonder too where um, kind of I'm. I guess I'm thinking more basketball. Like you have teams like Detroit that's in the city, smaller school. They're not going to out recruit Michigan or Michigan State. Like let's be honest, but they might be able to keep their guys around long enough where they can make a run and become like a Wichita State or someone that hey, we're in the city. We got enough deals where we're getting top talent for our level. And guys that might transfer from Michigan State, like Michigan State has one of the top guys. Um, I think they were transferring somewhere else. And so you look at that, and where's going to be a landing spot? Are they going to take that that next step down and then have a, available opportunities? Um, but like you said, with the the way like Alabama or someone where they're putting this stuff together, I honestly don't know if it hurts them too much because we were talking about Clemson and like how they have like their big car dealership that does a lot of funding for like the college and stuff like that where yeah they're kind of not near like a gigantic city um in terms of like population just because south carolina doesn't have that but they might have a gigantic corporation to kind of just say hey come to clemson we're going to give you deals we're going to give you hands-on like internships or whatever which is another big thing that people don't like they probably don't think about it but like the internship stuff that's like a lore for um, actual college students. That's now going to be kind of a thing for NIL too, where it's like, hey, you know, a lot of our people come to our program and they get placed with like so and so. They get interns, and then they list off these big companies. You're going to see the same type of pitch now for athletes, where it's like, hey, our guys, you have a chance to sign with like Nike or whatever, like Oregon, like whenever they do their thing. It's like that's going to be part of their deal. Like Maryland, hey, we do Under Armour, like that's our guy. And so, is it going to have a beneficial effect? I, I still think it's going to have to wait to play out, but we'll see. I just think it's a step in the good direction, the right direction for athletes because let's be honest, both a- athletes, when they sign, they don't have a big enough name to get a deal in place when they're coming out of high school anyway, right? The same like, yeah. on signing day, it's the same teams fighting for the same top twenty-five dudes, right? Like whoever well, was in the uh, um, All American game, you know. Well, one of the things that I I had heard, and I, I kind of like this idea, is being able to to allow players the opportunity to go to like using the the USFL and when the XFL gets off the ground, using those developmental leagues or the, those. Like lesser league, if you want to declare early, to be able to go to one of those leagues and and kind of bypass some of the college stuff, that you can immediately start your professional career, like do a one and done, like they do in basketball. If it, if it's so much more apparent that well, why why go that extra that extra year, and you're seeing more players now than ever are going back to college and finishing out their degree, so it's not that. You know, you're losing anything out by by declaring early. I, I, I think I, you know, that gives those leagues a little bit of an, an edge in the early development of players, giving them a role almost like a minor league to allow them to grow into the NFL while keeping like the, the NFL um, free agency pool a little bit more populated. And with NILs, I don't even know if that's going to be uh, as big of a thing. Because, like, um, just looking at it in terms of from, like, the Big Ten, seeing how they have basketball players, like, since that is how you directly brought up, like, the one-year, one-and-done, guys like Hunter Dickinson at Michigan that would have left. Like, he would have left. The guy from Illinois um, could have left. Kofi, but I think he did this year. Are they going to go? Um. Hunter Dickinson's back, and he said it's directly because of the NIL. If that wasn't in place, he would have left probably two years ago, you know, right after his freshman year. So I think you're going to kind of see it for some players where they might not have that fit. And others where, like, if they come back, you're going to dominate. Maybe you're going to make more money. Uh, like, if Illinois went on a run, does Kofi come back again? Like, do you just keep coming back to your, like, um, what was that guy from Wisconsin? Uh, the guy that took them to the natty that almost won it, like he was there for like four years or whatever. He could have went to the NBA, but he just like wasn't good enough. Kaminsky, 
uh, they like his game didn't really directly translate to the NBA, so they're kind of like, hey, you can stick around. And I wonder if you're going to see quarterbacks like that, where it's like, yeah, you're not projected to really be the style of NFL quarterback. And they can either say, you know what, I'm going to stay for four years, or I'm going to leave early and try to go. And if I don't make it, I'll just go with like the USFL route or XFL route or whatever. So I wonder what we see. Because there are going to be guys like that where you think, are you going to leave early? And then why are you doing that? Like, why are you leaving early? Because <laughs> there's like nowhere to go. Um, I look at it now and I know I keep bringing up Michigan guys, but those are the ones I know. Like, I'll talk my head. Like Chris Hinton came in. He was like a five-star defensive lineman. He left early this year. Didn't get drafted. So you look at it and you're like, okay, why did you leave? Like Michigan had two D linemen go. They would have went in the first round if Ajaba didn't get hurt, which sucks for Steelers because he ends up with the Ravens and he might be better than Hutchinson, you know? Once his talent fills out, it's like, ah, damn, of course the Ravens get a guy like that. Hoping that he heals 100%, you know? It's like, all right, you lost two guys. Now it would be your turn to step up. And you're going to go and say, well, you know what? I'm going to test my chance anyway. Is that because the USFL is there now? So will more players take that gamble? Even if they know that they might not be drafted? I don't know. But um, didn't the uh, the Notre Dame quarterback not get drafted either? So, like, we talked about big-time players with big names. Is that a guy potentially that's going to start that feeder system where if you make a roster, you don't get a chance? Are you going to end up? at one of these lower leagues and try to capitalize on that or not. Because we might have a real use case of like a big time school. Um, it was the guy that was in Wisconsin, wasn't it? I can't think of his name. I'll, let's look it up. Because that's going to be the one I think he was undrafted. Um, yeah, Jack Cohen. So he ended up assigning a deal with Indianapolis. But if he doesn't stick with the Colts, I think that would be a good case where you have a Notre Dame guy, one of the biggest schools. Now you can go to this minor league system and try to make your way into the NFL, you know? Yeah. So that's what I think those leagues need. I've been saying it. He might not be as big a name of, as like a Vince Young or someone. Well, and I think this but. is one of the things that we've talked about in the past too, where if, if you know, I'll just use Alabama as, as an arbitrary team, but like say you're the – you're a mid projected wide receiver and you know, going in that they're bringing in two or three guys that are going to push for your spot that do you, do you gamble on declaring or do you, you know, do you have another option because based off of who they're bringing in and, and what the projections are, I mean, you may just be the odd guy out there just like, you know, they're going to force a player's hand into into the, some of those things where in the past they the only option they had was to drop to FCS or Division Two or get buried on the bench where at least now with in, in this transfer portal type era they have that option of being able to try to go out. I, th- I think it would just only benefit them to have some other thing where I declared for the NFL I don't have that now you have that fallback of, of some of these other spring leagues yeah that's true because that does give smaller guys like an option. But like what if you're Jordan Addison, right? He would directly be the guy that the NCAA put this role in place. If he if the USC deal's real and he transfers there, would they get penalized? Like that'd be funny for Lincoln Riley. Because it was very clear that Lincoln Riley was like reaching out to all these transfers, right? <laughs> so like um, if he's giving NIL deals, which is against the new rolling by the NCAA, you know they're not going to do anything to USC, right? So, like, what are they going to do? Uh, but now he's, like, talking with the Longhorns. It's like, why would anyone in their right mind go to Texas, right? Pitt has played in bigger games than the Longhorns have. If you want to go to the NFL, are you, are you just trying to get, like, a one-year pay deal? You might go to Texas and not no one might ever see your name because you go six and six, Matt, or seven and whatever they end up going. Like I saw a thing where uh, someone put out that uh, we talked about signing like the same top teams are signing those or fighting over the top players anyway. And then I saw a thing where 
Nebraska had missed on top players since like 2009 or eight or something, whenever they played that championship game with Sue. Right. So then someone posted like their, their, um, in response, like how Texas had all these big ones, but then they have the same exact record as Texas. Like Texas gets all these big players. They've had the same record since that championship game as Nebraska virtually same wins, same everything. And it's really weird because people think like one North North North, or Nebraska, they really suck lately, you know, but then they have the same exact stuff as Texas and they're in a weaker division, right? Texas is losing to Kansas, man. Like at least Nebraska like loses to like uh, the most times the bigger teams in the Big Ten, and they upset like Oklahoma. Like I think they even beat Oklahoma the same amount of times as Texas. They don't even play them, Matt, <laughs> which is hilarious. <laughs> but maybe I'm wrong on that one. Uh, but I did see an Oklahoma stat in there where because even last year Nebraska played them close, right? I think Texas ended up beating them last year. But that's the one thing where I look at it's like, why are you going there? Like Pitt could use you. Pitt obviously elevated your game. I know Kenny Pickett left, but like, what are you seeing at Texas where you're like, that's where I want to go? You know, I, I could see the uncertainty with Oklahoma with Lincoln Riley leaving, and you don't know what they're going to run on offense. But like, even like Ohio State, like, just go there. Do you not want to compete? I, I just don't see the like the appeal of these top guys looking around unless, like you said, you go to an Alabama. Or you go to an Ohio State, a team that's been consistently in the top in terms of production and getting dudes drafted. Like, what school has put more dudes, like wide receivers in the league than those two teams? I don't know. If it's not them, I don't know. So why would you want to go anywhere else? That's, that's my number one um, concern with him. It's kind of off, to- off topic, but I wanted to bring it up since we talked about it last week. Now he's looking at Austin after that NCAA ruling. Maybe it's just a smoke screen so he can sign his USC deal. I don't know. But that just seems dumb, right? <laughs> Nothing against Texas. I just <laughs> Yeah. And if they go to the SEC, it's only going to be worse. I mean, A&M struggled to compete in the SEC. I know that they're finally putting together their Georgia run where they're going to have like they're going to use money to sign like the top class like 4 years in a row or whatever and try to win the championship. Because that's how long it took Georgia, right? So it's going to take a year for the A&M thing to pay off. And the year that they basically get to that level, Texas will be in the league, right? Uh, which I also wanted to bring up. I had two more things. Uh, I do, this is going to be short. I don't want to forget about it. But the UCF, um, they're looking at exploring joining the Big 12 next year. UCF, Houston, and Cincinnati. They're going to pay their way out with whatever. There's rumors that they're looking into the money. There's also rumors that Oklahoma and Texas might be looking into kind of the same thing, where if they get, if they, as other teams get out of the league and they join the Big 12 and the Big 12 ends up paying like their buyouts or whatever, kind of like the Big 10 paid Maryland's to get out of the ACC or whatever, and then they had to pay it back, you know? Um, could theoretically then Texas or Oklahoma then get out without having to pay a penalty because the team's poaching other conferences anyway. What's the difference, like legally? So I wonder if there's going to be some movement there. I don't know how much it would really matter. Like, does it matter if Texas and Oklahoma leave early? Not really. Uh, But that segues into my next thing, divisions. The NCAA has ruled that divisions aren't necessary for a championship game anymore. So the big one that has been pushing for this, the ACC, they're looking at starting it next year too, where I always complain about the Coastal because the Coastal sucks. And it makes zero sense how much like they put that together. Like the regional rivalries are messed up with that and the travel's messed up with that. And it really doesn't make sense. The Big Ten did something weird like that. They got rid of it and just did a geographical split. I thought the ACC should do the same thing where they have the North teams and the South, and if the South ends up being more powerful like the Big Ten East, oh, well, it's it's geographics. Like, we can't change that, you know? Like, wh- what are we going to do? Have the state flip? Like, no, it's not going to matter. But it would at least give balance and create a sense of, like, recruiting pride for, like, some of those schools like Pitt 
And if you're seeing the same teams, like if Pitt could get on a run of winning the ACC North like three or four times in a row, maybe their recruiting will pick up. They get guys like Addison in the, in the NFL that would help really bolster the ACC where the way the divisions are now, it's kind of like, oh, whoever just wins the Coastal, you don't get that bragging right because the teams you play are like all up and down the East Coast. You're really competing against teams in the other division. And then even then it's like, okay, you have Florida State and Miami, they're recruiting against each other, but um, they're in opposite divisions. Miami's really been shit in the bed, so Florida State can point at them and laugh. And then um, no, not really any upward movement there. Movement there. So like Pitt is in a position where they're in a lose-lose. They're in a lose-lose. So they win the ACC or whatever. The ACC really doesn't want them to win it. But if you did the North-South split, at least you have a better chance of like the South winning every year. Like the Big Ten where they're like, hey, you other guys, you come in. Should be an easy game for our big teams. Like Michigan's just going to run all over Iowa. Ohio State's going to just crush Northwestern or whoever they play, Wisconsin, and then they can rest up for the bowl season, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that, Matt, that's exactly how the Big Ten championship game games have gone, right? Like the Michigan, what was that? Iowa score? It's like 40-something to like three. Like they just ran all over them, and they were like, all right, thanks, guys. Thanks for showing up. That was a good warm-up, even though it didn't really matter because Georgia was just that much better. <laughs> <laughs> but same with Ohio State, they're killing Northwestern, and maybe it hurts them, right? Because then didn't Ohio State lose to uh, Clemson that year pretty bad? Or was that the close year? See, like, you don't really know. But I don't think having a tough championship game matters at all. Like, it honestly doesn't. It could only hurt you. Look at the SEC. They were dangerously close from having, like, this past year, uh, like, Georgia not make the playoffs, you know? If Oklahoma State wins, does Georgia make the playoffs last year? Because Oklahoma State being out kind of let them in because it's either they let Georgia out because they lost their championship game or they let Cincinnati out, an undefeated team, right? Because I don't think Oklahoma State or Michigan would have been left out. And you can't leave Alabama out. They won the SEC. So like they were very dangerously close that Oklahoma State luckily lost that game for them. So and on the other side, Michigan's just coasting, you know. Hey, let's just we'll paste Iowa. That was a good game. And uh, we're ready to get selected on playoff Sunday or whatever they call it. So that's what I want to see. What are your thoughts, though, directly from the ACC? Do you think this benefits Florida State? And then I'll give my opinion after. In some ways, I think that it does. Because it's it's a, basically been... Clemson and Florida State's conference relatively w- within relative recent history. I mean, I know Pitt won it last year, but you know, when, when you're looking at at the competent the level of competition, it's always just kind of boiled down to um, whoever wins that game is going to win the win the conference, and they're going to play for that bigger bowl. And I know that you know we've kind of talked about this in the past where they've aligned it for success because. With it, you want you don't want those teams getting so beat up to the point where, you know, we criticize the Big Twelve in years past where Oklahoma and whoever play earlier in the year, and then they play a second time. You know, whether it's Oklahoma Baylor or Oklahoma Oklahoma State, they play the that game earlier in the year, and then for the championship game, they're playing the same team again, and when they split. The seer, you know, both of those games, it essentially knocks a Big Twelve out of any any serious bull contention, and so I think to that end, like it does kind of hurt, but at the same time, I think it is, it may give the ACC a little bit more flexibility if they're able to maintain. Like Florida State and Clemson have always played. Florida State and Miami have always played. Keep those teams, like keep those those key games intact. But then it also gives you the flexibility with your scheduling that, um, you know, maybe you get more of those cross right now cross division rivals that you're not not able to schedule on an annual basis. And so that's where I'm kind of worried because the Big Ten's looking at doing the same thing. They've been talking about how it's unfair that the other conferences only play eight games, and then they say that well we have rivalry games and the Big Ten plays rivalries anyway except for Notre Dame like backing out of them. Because if Notre Dame didn't back out of the Big Ten series, 
I would think that most Big Ten teams are playing nine games and then a rival. Like Penn State has been playing Pitt or whatever on and off. Uh, Michigan was playing like Notre Dame. So like you're playing those schedules one better than the other conferences, all right? So drop it at the eight. They're, I've been saying this for years. They're way behind on it. They should have already done it. Like Michigan should have been playing Eastern Michigan and, and Western Michigan every year and not playing like Army and Colorado and whatever. And then the, the nine game schedule, like that's just idiotic. And you're like, wonder why we're beat up. It's like, yeah, because you guys aren't getting yourself a break. So if they do it, great. I am worried about you brought up Florida State. I think it really screws Florida State and teams like Michigan where um, everyone considers you a rival in the conference. I know we've joked about it, but like in the fact where if you do the, the permanent crossover games, like if you're Michigan, I don't see how you don't play Ohio State and Michigan State every year. So if you only have two crossover games, it has to be those two. And on the other side, like Ohio State gets Michigan and then what? Illinois? Like they're not going to have a rival, like the, the, a secondary rival, their rivals like Michigan State, unless the Big Ten goes bold and gives them Penn State. But then like what do you do for the Penn State side? Is it Rutgers? Is it Maryland? Because I would think that Michigan and, and Ohio State are both going to be pissed in that scenario where it's like, okay, cool. That's Penn State's rival though. Like, did you just make a circle, though, and add Michigan State as the other rival? <laughs> so that you're just playing, like, a circle of hate, and then the rest of the conference just kind of is there? It's saying, like, you know, guys, our Big Ten East has been pretty good. We're just going to make the rules for them, and the rest of you guys, like, sorry, Nebraska, you're kind of out. But I honestly think it makes the most sense where you can kind of do that and then have the rest of them kind of float around where it's like Nebraska can play Iowa, Iowa can play... Like, who does Iowa play then? Do they play North Nebraska and Wisconsin, like two of the, the better teams, like, historically? Like, I just don't know. Three teams kind of makes more sense. But then again, like, Michigan has, like, Minnesota, one of the better teams in the West. Like, is that going to be their third rival? Meanwhile, Penn State's, like, what, racking up Maryland and Rutgers? <laughs> it's like, hey, these are our geographic rivals. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Sorry, Michigan. we got to play these guys every year. It's like, all right, cool. Cool beans, guys. Because that's what I think, like, Florida State's in the same boat. You're going to play Clemson every year. You're also going to play Miami every year. Who's Miami's other rival? Like, did they just pick a Big Ten like, or a Big East foe? Is it going to be Pitt? Or is it going to be like, hey, Miami, you get this, and then you get some cream puff. You get Boston College, you know? But, like, I've I've never had an issue with how they're going to schedule that. Like, I, I know... Th- in theory, that that kind of hurts, like Michigan compared to Penn State playing that type of schedule. But in Florida State's non-conference, they've also always played Florida in non-conference. So like, it's not like yeah, that's oh, that's oh, exactly it, making it worse. You know, that's like, why I said like you're gonna give you're like you're gonna give me the easier conference slate, and that and the, you're you're still playing a tough non-conference slate. We're still opening with LSU this year. Like, there's. That was one of the things that I liked that drew me to to liking Florida State was the fact that Bobby Bowden said, "If you're going to be the best team, you'll play anyone anywhere." And I, and I kind of like that that confidence that if you're gonna if you're gonna be a champion, you got to play those tougher games. Now, I think in in some aspects it hurts because if you're get if you're getting yourself so thumped up with your non conference slate that you're not able to perform in conference, but it doesn't matter at this point because if you're if you're splitting the conference up, if you're you're having it so that you don't need that championship game per se, then you I think it, it benefits you to play a tougher schedule and win. If you have the if you have the people in place that you can be competitive with it, I think you're better off playing the tougher slate because otherwise you pull a Cincinnati or you pull you know Notre Dame play some really cupcake games. And I think that it's a really bad look when you go to the playoff or you go to your bowl game and you get blown out by 60 points. That so what was all the hype about? Like I, I think there, there there has to be a level of you 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 want to earn your your seat when you make it that far. Well, that's like Notre Dame, Matt. There's not it's not a coincidence that they were able to have great seasons once they got rid of some of their other traditional rivals, right? Like nothing against. Like Penn State and Pitt, but like if you're looking at it, Michigan's going to play those top teams. They're also going to play 
will go back to playing Notre Dame in the offseason as their rival. And then Penn State's like playing Pitt or West Virginia. Like I know those are good football teams, but they're like not as good as Notre Dame, especially not in, in recruiting. And like you're saying with like injuries, you could look at last year. That was the first year Michigan's had without a major injury. And that's what it took to beat Ohio State. Like every other year you can say like, oh, Wilton Spate gets hurt. Um, so-and-so gets hurt. It's like, oh, right. The only injury Michigan really had is the backup quarterback last year, McCarthy, who ended up, I don't think he, did he have surgery in this off season? Like that's going to mess with the quarterback battle this year. But last year, the, the core group of players didn't get hurt. And I think that that's one thing that you have to look at where it's like, that's where play the stuff schedule, but big 10, you got to start giving an extra bye week. Like that's the other thing that the other conferences have that the big 10 doesn't. Like Alabama plays Alcorn State or someone before they play Auburn. Like you got to start get, putting that buffer game in before that last game of the year, because then you're get, getting your guys healthier. You're letting Ohio State get healthy, uh, Michigan get healthy, Penn State get healthy late in the season. You're not giving them a November of Iowa, Michigan State, and then Ohio State, or like what was Penn State's the one year where like they're playing uh, Michigan then Maryland, then Michigan State, or then Ohio State, and then Michigan State. It's like, why are you doing that? <laughs> like, why are you screwing Penn State like that? Because you know that if they get banged up in that first game against Michigan or whatever it was, I think that's who it was, then then, then they're, they might get a little bit of healing against Maryland. Then you're throwing them to the Wolves against Ohio State. And then Ohio State's like saying, well, we got to play Penn State and then Michigan. Thanks, guys. Like, that's a great, great way to end our year. Because then you play those two teams, you get a little bit of a relief because you beat your rival or whatever. You go to the Big Ten Championship game, and then you're what? You're dead? You get, like, upset? I know they ha- that hasn't really happened, but that's what I want to see. You say you're there for the players, but your conference, you got to look at it. So I wonder what tricks ACC can pull to get closer to the SEC. I think right now the number one thing that the SEC has had, having, like, that – those lesser crossover games and more flexibility with playing like non rivals and like weaker power five teams. Like I'm sure Florida state would say like, Hey, we're playing good schools, but they would much rather slay a Kansas team and then get to November and say like, Hey, we are 11 win team. Like the 11 win has a bigger perception over the 10 win teams, like the 10 win, like school records or whatever. Cause Harbaugh is pulling in 10 win seasons um, a bunch of times his first couple seasons, and people were saying, well, that's not good enough. Look at James Franklin. He's pulling in 11 win seasons. It's like the schedules aren't comparable. Look at, look at who Penn State's playing in the offseason. They're not playing anybody. Then they finally play Auburn or whatever, and they get the four downs like messed up. They lose that game or whatever. They beat them. I think they beat Auburn, didn't they? So it helps the perception, but you actually have to win in conference. So what are you doing? You can't have both. And then you can't say like, hey, well, you know, you might have be, did better in conference, but you only got 10 wins because you lost another day. I'm like, why would you do that? Well, I just think in general, like you're not right now. The SEC is so far ahead, uh, it is, specifically for football. They're so far ahead because they have they, they have the big money donors in place that that will, will push the envelope down there. Where I think like some of the other schools, specifically in the north, are a little bit more are appearing to be more hesitant and waiting for more guidance from the NCA before they jump really aggressively into this NIL type situation. Um, I think it's, it's you're seeing the the payoffs. Like you had Ole Miss that came out of nowhere. I mean, I wonder I wonder why they had like that those ridiculous classes recently. They were paying players before it was even NIL, and you have Georgia with a run, and A and M's coming up, and Bama's still like w- w- what they are, and like they have the these situations where I don't know that you can if there's anything that the ACC could do to even get in that that same mindset right now. I, I, don't, I don't because I think the SEC is that much further ahead, and that's why I want to see them. The only way you compete with the SEC is by just talking about it. Remember, the SEC, they weren't winning all the games, but they were saying, like, hey, we are the best football conference. They weren't showing it, you know. They were losing crossover matchups. They were doing all this stuff. Florida was coming in. 
Florida was losing to Michigan every time they played them. Michigan wasn't even good. And so then they were like, yeah, but look at Alabama. Like They had the one team that was, that was showing up after a while, um, even though they had other schools mixed in, which, I mean, to credit to them, they were able to do that. But they also got, took advantage of the BCS by inflating their win-loss records by playing nobody. So, like, other than the, the three teams that had crossover games or whatever, not all schools had those crossover games. Like, do you think Vanderbilt has a crossover <sighs> rival that's tough from another conference? Like, hell no. Teams are scheduled, well, teams are lining up to play them so they can beat the shit out of them. But I think that's <laughs> like, also, like, that's one of the things that's going to hurt Michigan is that every team wants to have, like, some kind of playing game. It's like you can't even say you, you're going to play your rival because they'll be like, well, which one? We, we have a we have a bucket, a cup, a, I know. Someone a said, blade of grass. Well, like, hey, Michigan should just play all their trophy games. I'm like, well, you know, Ohio State doesn't have a trophy, but Northwestern does. So, like, which trophy game are you talking about? Because the Big Ten will do something dumb, like do that, but then give Ohio State and Michigan one more crossover game, you know, because they're special. They'll be like, well, you guys got to play your rivals and you got to play this other game. So then you're instantly playing one more game against teams that hate you. Because I think like, beating you is a Super Bowl. <laughs> so it's like, all right. Like, Michigan State literally got their Peach Bowl rings and put the Michigan score on it this year. Like, how many other teams are doing that, Matt? It got <laughs> <laughs> Like, you can't say, hey, oh, well, Michigan State's just good. Like, no, that's their Super Bowl. They don't care about the other games. They got the rings. Otherwise, why would they put that on? And I think Ohio State kind of does that, too, where they put the Michigan score on their their other bowl game rings. It's like, all right, like, we get it, guys. <laughs> we get it. What happens this year? Like, you've won the Rose Bowl. Does it just have Rose Bowl? Is the other side blank now? But, <laughs> <laughs> but when you have so many teams doing that stuff, it's kind of hard to be like, like they want to play you because then that helps their fans. It helps sell tickets. Like we get it, but in terms of like making the Big Ten better, it doesn't make the Big Ten better. Same with like Florida State. Florida State would much. I mean, even Clemson. Like they would be much better not playing each other. Playing like they Florida State could play Miami. That way you can say like, well, if they lose to Miami, maybe Miami will just be good, and they can take over. And then like their ideal would be having them match up in the camp championship game for the right to play. So you're not playing against a weaker schedule. But then you really have to weigh it against it. Like the Big Ten kind of built that in with Michigan and Ohio State playing the last game of the year. I think that's why they started to push the Penn State and Michigan and Notre Dame or Ohio State games so much later. So that if Penn State ends up being the top team, that they're getting that marquee game in November. It's like, yeah, but you're just hurting Penn State by doing that or hurting one of the other teams because they're playing back to back games. Like it doesn't make sense. Put it in October, like the SEC did with. Like, Penn State playing Michigan and Ohio State should always be in October. Um, like, I think the Ohio State one around Halloween's been great for whenever Penn State plays them then. Because, like, if you look back to the old Alabama-LSU games, they were always earlier in the year. And then if they had to play again, which they, they never did because they're on the same side, it didn't really matter. It didn't matter, and that was kind of lucky because Auburn's just on that side. So, Well, how would you feel about doing that, like, doing your – schedule this way where they're looking preseason and they're saying okay like and i know a lot of these schedules are already built years in advance but if you're saying we're we're anticipating for this year that ohio state and michigan are going to be the two teams that with no with no divisions are represented in the in their bowl game or for the conference championship play that year like have it scheduled for the last week in the event that you're both do what you need to do. You have that game set up so that you just bump it back an extra week. And now you're still playing your rival. You're still playing that, but it's for the, the conference championship. See, that would be better than playing twice, but you know, I mean, that game got so much more attendance. Like it was better than like most other games combined, Matt. The or TV ratings, the Big Ten, uh, Ohio State and Michigan. That's why I saw some teams like uh, someone would put a poll like, hey, what's going to be the first game that ESPN or Fox picks this year? It's like, you know, it's going to be Ohio State, Michigan just because no one else comes close. Unless you end up with an, like a top Auburn team. That's really been the only game that's close on TV, Auburn, Alabama. But it's every year. Like Michigan hasn't even been good, Matt. But looking at it last year, like they would have played Ohio State again. They both would have been eight and one. And that's where it's kind of like, 
I almost like their idea from when it was COVID, where you end up playing two games where you don't have a repeat. And some people might call me an idiot, but I wonder if you could do that and you take the top four teams that are left and you try not to have a repeat. So like Michigan, Ohio State, Michigan State, and Iowa last year, I think you would have got the same thing where the uh, Michigan gets the first pick because they're the best team. They're not going to play Ohio State again. They're going to end up against Iowa because they didn't play them. Um, they did lose to Michigan State, so you could have a rematch there. But do you really want it? That way you're guaranteed your champion tries not to have a rematch, right? Because Michigan didn't play Iowa going in. So they would have been 7-2. and two. And then the second game is the second chance game. So then you have Ohio State and Michigan State playing for the Rose Bowl, right? Because Michigan and Iowa are playing for the, the national championship. They're playing for the playoff game or whatever. If Iowa wins, then they're in the Rose Bowl. You get it? If Iowa yeah. loses, the second place game becomes the Rose Bowl game. And I think you would have more importance that way. And um, going there, like I wonder, I'm going to see if I can find, because I think no one's really talked about that. But I think that that's the only way that it can kind of make sense, you know, where you don't get the championship game as a rematch. You're not screwing over your top team because theoretically your top two teams, if it's going to be a rematch, if you're saying, hey, sorry, Florida State and Clemson, you might have to play each other every year. Um, That's tough breaks, you know. I think teams would rather (laughs) see that where it's kind of like a reward and it. I guess it, it really matters. Like the only reason the Big Ten it sucks for them, and it would suck for Alabama and Auburn is that game's been the last game of the year for how many years? They're not gonna like the only other option would be to move it up into October, and then have it as a float game, and then from there, then you're saying, okay, um, whatever, maybe then it can be a repeat because it's been so many games from that, and I think that that would make sense. But again, it's kind of like, all right what is going on after that? Um, Even looking at the COVID year, like Ohio State finished two. uh, They would have been, and maybe this isn't the best year to look at, but then you have Ohio State, Indiana, Northwestern, and Iowa, and then you can just do the crossover games, which Ohio State gets the first pick. And by first pick, I don't mean they get to pick which team they play. They, They go down the list or whatever, like they would play the fourth place team or whatever, like whatever team they didn't play yet. Because if they beat the top two from the other side or whatever, because you got to remember, there's not going to be any divisions, though. So, like, I guess, what was the year that the ACC played with no divisions? Was it 2020? 2020? Might have been. Because that that might be the best year to look at. Because if you remember Clemson and Notre Dame, they played again, right? Could you imagine? Yeah, it was this one. So Notre Dame wins the regular season. Hey, congratulations, guys. You got to play Clemson, which, of course, they lose. Kicks them out of the playoffs, right? Or no, they both made the playoffs. But in a regular year, they would have been kicked out of the playoffs because I don't think you would have had that. I think the other conferences not playing like the Pac-12 or whatever really screwed them over. So the ACC could look at that year and say, well, that was really dumb of us. Okay? Uh, What if we looked at the top four teams, Notre Dame, Clemson, Miami, and North Carolina? Did Notre Dame play those those other ones? Because you could start with North Carolina and have a one verse four, kind of rewarding your top team by playing like, hey, and if it was a rematch, then you kind of just look at it from the next thing. Uh, I'm trying to see if they played all these teams. I think they might have, though. Which then again, you're kind of like, all right, well, we tried to really help you out. You're going to play the fourth place team. But that way you're kind of avoiding the rematch. They played North Carolina. No, they did not play Miami. So there, perfect. Your top game, Notre Dame plays Miami. That's the first game. Uh, Clemson plays North Carolina. And you're giving your team another chance to get into the playoffs. Because uh, most likely, like, what if Clemson would have been out or whatever? If Clemson loses that game to Notre Dame. Uh, it hurts. It's going to hurt half your teams, right? By doing a 1-2, no rematch, you're able to get away from that, I think. And hell, even if... Like, I would say just try to do one verse four and two verse three. Why does it really need to be 
a conference champion, right? Like, who cares? If it ends up being the same record, then just name co-champs. But some people would kind of hate that idea. I think they like the idea of the consolation game. But, like, I'm just trying to avoid rematches because I think it makes for better television. And it's another way to elevate your next team. Like, like I said, the Big Ten had Northwestern there. Most times, Northwestern, they're going to get in the championship game. They're going to get killed. Maybe they would beat Indiana if Ohio State had to play Iowa, you know? Maybe that would elevate them up. Where Or even Indiana, they were close. People were talking about them making the playoffs maybe that year. If they beat the team that they're playing because they don't have to play Ohio State again or whatever, maybe that gives them one more quality win where they're like, hey, you know what? We can put them in the playoffs now. So I, I think a conference needs to think outside the box. Uh, but I know we kind of went long on that. Do you have anything else on it? I mean, I... I- I kind of like that direction. I think you used the the Alabama Auburn analogy, and I think you're you're not off with it. But I think like using the SEC is difficult because with them, they don't have anything to lose. Like at this point, they're the argument isn't now is an SEC team getting in. It's is it two? Is it three? Like they're trying to they're trying to justify as many teams as they can to try to get them in. And I and I don't know that a two or three SEC is better than what the Big Ten has to offer, what the, when the ACC is on, what the ACC has. I'm not going to sit here and tell you every year, oh, yeah, we definitely have a team that needs to be in. But I don't think every year that the SEC has needed a team in. Well, see, that's why you know? I'm, I'm kind of leaning towards the Big Ten because go back to the year Penn State got screwed, right? They played, um, they won the Big Ten. They beat Wisconsin in the championship game. Right, Michigan and Ohio State went to overtime that year. Let's say you have the second place game. The second place game by de facto becomes Ohio State Michigan. They have to play again. What if Michigan beats Ohio State the second time? Because it was at home, um, a neutral site. Now you you can't say that it wouldn't. Maybe the game would have flipped. They play twice. That elevates Michigan up to the Rose Bowl or whatever. Penn State then makes the playoffs. They'd already beat Ohio State. Why would they have to beat them twice, you know? And so I think that that's going to kind of put them into the situation where um, overall, in terms of playoffs, maybe that's enough to get a second Big Ten team in a couple years. Because, like, what if Wisconsin, um, maybe Penn State already beat Wisconsin or whatever that year because I didn't look at the matchups. Maybe Wisconsin then doesn't have to get beat by Penn State. Maybe Wisconsin plays Ohio State, beats them, and then Penn State and both Wisconsin get in. Where these other conferences, like you're saying, the NCC already gets the benefit of the doubt. So who cares, right? Um, but the ACC and the Big Ten, I think they have to look at it and say, why not give our teams one more chance? We're locked into the Rose Bowl anyway. Like, they're basically picking, hey, if Michigan loses, we're going to put them in the Rose Bowl. Or like, hey, oh, yeah, Ohio State, they're definitely getting in over Michigan State, no matter what, you know, if they lose to Michigan. Like, that's what they were talking about. Hey, oh, can't wait till we get Ohio State or Michigan in the Rose Bowl, you know? That's what they were talking about last year. So you can't tell me that they wouldn't want to play one more time. And I'm not I don't I don't think it would hurt Michigan or Penn State or or Ohio State. I think it's gonna give them one more chance. Give those teams one more chance to make the playoffs. And then you don't see teams like Ohio State getting getting cut out, Penn State getting cut out of the playoffs because they have a chance for one more win. Because even if Ohio State loses to Penn State or whatever, and that or they had that one, what's the year they had the bad loss and they did, the Big Ten didn't get a team in the playoffs? What if the team that they they crushed, Penn State, gets another quality win? Is that enough to help their strength strength of schedule? It might be, right? That's the the SEC thing is they were like, well, they always play top teams. Now you're giving one of the top teams that you either beat or maybe lost to, like Michigan State last year. What if they get that, that, that second chance against Ohio State because it came out flat? What if they beat them? Right? That's the team that beat Michigan. Does Michigan then get the number one seed? Makes sense. And then it changes everything all around because they're like, well, well, shit. Uh, we were saying that Georgia or the Alabama has to be the one seed because they have the better strength of schedule. It's like, well, the Michigan team that or the team that beat Michigan ended up winning their Big Ten consolation, or, or they're not going to call it that. I don't even know what the hell they'd call it. They just call it championship weekend or whatever. But like, yeah, they end up beating Michigan. Like Michigan and Michigan State are the top two teams in the conference. 
let's go. Michigan State has a chance then to play in the Rose Bowl, right? Or they can even be in the playoffs because all those other teams lost. You never know. I think it would only take one or two years of doing that, and the SEC would copy it. I guarantee they would copy it because they have all the top teams now. Could you imagine if like, they have like, oh, sorry, Oklahoma, you really didn't beat Alabama, but now you get to play Florida. Or you get another game against um, another rematch with LSU or someone. I think it makes a lot of sense. And television, they're going to get the money because most likely you're going to get a big school. And hell, if one of the one of the conference championship games flop, it's flopping to like 8 million people, Matt. So you're still getting more than most regular season games anyway. But I think having that stick where before it was like, oh, Michigan, Ohio State, they're playing to see who goes to the Rose Bowl. That's gone. They're playing to maybe make the playoffs. But the secondary teams, now they have a chance to play for the Rose Bowl, if that makes sense. Right? So you're giving yeah. them two opportunities. Um, I know we're going long, so we'll cut it off. I'm going to try to – maybe I'll try to fine-tune it. I'll bring in some other seasons next year, next week because it is the offseason. Um, NHL and NBA playoffs, the one thing I wanted to talk about, and this will kind of be my final bell since we went long. I was watching the Canes game, Matt, and uh, was it the Br- Boston? They're in Boston. The fans are banging on the glass. A piece broke off and hit their, like, <laughs> official in the booth. Yeah, I saw that. It knocked him out. Like, it knocked him out cold. And so watching the game live, it's like, hey, that guy just got knocked out by the glass. And I'm thinking, like, did a guy punch the glass so hard, like, his fist, like, hit him in the head? Because I, like, didn't show it at first. And they just showed the guy in the stretcher. And I'm like, this is insane. Like, and um, I almost took a picture. I just missed it. And, uh, of course, I'm watching it live, so I didn't have, like, the Rewind TV or whatever. But the guys on the stretcher, and right behind them are, like, three ads for some furniture store. It's like, hey, bro, this injury is brought to you by Big Bob's Furniture or something like that it was called. I was like, oh, my God. this You can't even make this up. That the TV is just sitting there on that, and I can't find my phone to take a picture of it. But it was insane. Like, I never saw a piece of glass break like that. Just in half. And like they casually just bring out another piece of glass, like, hey, here we, luckily we had a piece there that fits that weird corner. Because you would think that, I mean, I guess maybe they do have all, I would hope that all glasses are the same size, but um, I guess it would be fly. I don't know. I'm not a stadium, so I don't know how that, that glass piece fits. Maybe they are all the same size, so that if they need to replace them during the game, they can easily do it. But I thought that was one of the craziest things I've seen. And the NBA, I wanted to talk, I just mentioned, like, we talk about all the top teams moving on for how many years in a row now. Like, oh, if you're, if you're a one, two seed, maybe a three seed, you have a chance of moving on. But all of their series are locked in battle right now. Philadelphia and Miami are two and two. Boston and Milwaukee, two and two. Phoenix and Dallas are two and two. And Golden State, the three seed, they're up on Memphis number two, three to one. So there are, is going to be a chance of moving on. Um, maybe having a lower seed, but again, every one, two, three, and four seed moved on, Matt, in the playoffs. Why are you even playing that opening round? I would almost <laughs> wish that they got, cut the games in the opening round and just made it single elimination. It might make the rest of the playoffs more fun. Right? If they did, or maybe like they did like a, a, a play in bracket. So it's your team that loses that first game and then you're screwed. I don't care. It would be more fun. Like, they would have excitement. The first round, do you really think I was worried about the Celtics losing to Brooklyn? They, they swept them 4 0. Like, I Brooklyn, think you were a little worried. Brooklyn has been a mess. So, I, I wish maybe they could just in, include all of the teams and then the top eight teams get a bye the first time, the first round or whatever. Maybe even the top four teams get two byes. And they could work it out where they could play a single elimination tournament to get to the the Elite Eight, you know? I think it would make it more fun. And you might see some upsets. Because right now, most likely the top teams are getting through. And is it really a difference between the, the number one and two seeds? Like, most likely they're going to win. At least give them some skin in the game. Because, like, if Miami would have been upset, because um, they, they went 4-1 and one against Atlanta, so they did lose one game to them. What if that was the one-loss playing game? Or like LeBron, he's out of the playoffs, right? So what if his team wins a single elimination tournament to make the playoffs? I think it would be more fun, and I would like to see it. Kind of like baseball does that single elimination thing. 
that I kind of hated and they're like t- expanding or whatever. Um, in basketball, it makes more sense to me because have it all on one weekend. And I think the ratings would be through the roof. I didn't bring in the ratings, but that's what I was thinking when I looked at it. Um, hockey's been doing all right. The Penguins, dude, have you seen how many goals they've been scoring? An insane amount. <laughs> I, 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 I put my head down and like they're scoring again. I was like, <laughs> I feel bad for the Rangers. They were talking about like, well, they need to get this guy out of the game so he can uh, get ready for the next game. I'm like, the next game? He's giving up like seven goals two games in a row. <laughs> I know they're like flipping goalies or whatever. I'm like, what the hell? Unbelievable. And the Canes are playing right now. They're playing Boston. They were up 2-0. Um, they had to win tonight 5-1. And so I hope that they can close it out and move on. But I wonder if hockey's going to start to see – because you're getting into the place where are the top teams going to move on? Florida had a chance to really go down, and I was surprised they even came back and beat the Capitals uh, in overtime. Because I thought, well, Florida looked like the team to beat. If they get eliminated, it might be the team, the winner of the Canes Penguins, if they both move on, making the the finals. So I think a lot of excitement going on. So I'm hoping for that scenario to play out but we'll see what happens um what do you have for do you have anything for the final bell um not so much this week just check out southboundsports.com yeah go there um if you have ideas for college football since we're in the off season let me know send them to me text them hit me up on, on twitter or whatever uh that's the best way to get him because i kind of want to see if you start throwing out ideas who knows who's listening from the nca maybe they'll take him into account. I'll start hammering the Big Ten and telling them, hey, play a second game. Play a second game. Like, you're, you're putting your rights up for bid. It makes so much sense. Maybe I'll start to just hammer Twitter. So follow us on there. Go to SouthboundSports.com and we'll keep you up to date. But uh, we'll be talking about it more next week. So thanks for listening and we'll see you then.